Thanks. Uh, well, today our scripture comes to us from John 20. Uh, it's going to be on the screen, and it's also uh, on the front of your bulletin if you want to follow along that way, or if you have your Bible, that would be, be great. And this is uh, Jesus appears to his disciples on the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together. With the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hand and sides, or his hands and side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Will you pray with me? Lord, we are here, and we have gathered in this place, a place that is special to us, a place where we gather with our friends and our family to worship you, but we also gather to hear your word proclaimed. And so this morning, we are especially asking and leaning into the truth of your word that says that it will not be proclaimed and returned void. And so, Lord, will you help us not only be hearers of your word, but doers of your word and all, that we, we might be inspired and changed by the hearing of your word for us today. Amen. So, it's still Easter, and so I thought today it might be kind of interesting for us to look at what does it mean to be an Easter people, to live as an Easter people. You've heard that phrase before, and, and so I thought we'd talk about it a little bit. And this text that we've read this morning is really interesting and unique in that it is used not only for Easter, but often at Pentecost. And so um, that really kind of made it stand out to me. And the reason it can be used for both of those seasons is because in this one text, just these four verses, we see both the appearance of the risen Savior and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And for John and his gospel, this, this text really marks the beginning of what we call the post-Easter church. It marks the beginning of the post-Easter church. And very simply, you could divide this text just into two, two halves. The first part would be 19 through 20, where we see the risen Lord appear. And then the second half, 21 through 22, those verses is where the disciples receive their commission and uh, we see the Holy Spirit is given. Uh, so what does it mean for us to live as an Easter people? And I believe we find three things in our text today. First, we find that to celebrate, um, we have a risen Savior at Easter. And we celebrate the beginning of our mission. And as an Easter people, we celebrate the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. If you'll remember back with me for a moment, Mary Magdalene is on her way to the tomb, and she is not expecting to see Jesus in a risen state. She has, in fact, gone to anoint his body, prepare it for burial. And uh, we know this not only because of how the account goes, but she does not even recognize Jesus when he is there and appears to her at first until he calls her by name and says, Mary. And we learn from this account that it is a personal encounter with the risen Lord that changes our lives. She is so excited, of course, that she's met the risen Lord that she runs off to tell the other disciples. And then what happens? They don't believe her, right? And so that's where we pick up today in uh, verse 20. It says, it is not until the disciples have their own personal experience with the risen Lord that they come to that moment of belief. And so that is to say that when we celebrate that we have a risen Savior, we also have to have our own personal experience with the living Lord. Because we see in our scripture that we cannot base our faith upon someone else's experience. We can't base our faith upon someone else's experience. Each of us must come to our own personal encounter with the living Christ. And last week, Jeremy talked to us during the sermon on Easter that it's okay for us to even pray for God to affirm uh, his presence in our lives, to reveal himself to us so that we might experience his spirit in our hearts and the, the outpouring of his love 
to be spread abroad in our hearts. It's okay to pray for that. It made me think of that verse in Mark 9, 24, where the man is seeking healing for his son, and he cries out, I believe, but help my unbelief. And so it's okay for us to ask for him to reveal himself to us. Because we see in our scripture today that it is not enough for us to know about Jesus or to have heard about Jesus, that we cannot base our faith upon someone else's experience with Christ. And it doesn't matter if you've come to this church all your life or today's your first day. It's okay for us to pray for God to reveal himself, make himself known to us. Because there is a significant difference. There's a significant difference in us when we have our own personal experience with Christ. You see, our scripture also teaches us that when we have that personal experience with the risen Christ, that we receive a peace that passes all understanding. It says it there in the verse, because not once but twice Jesus says, peace be with you, peace be with you. And he says this to undergird or to emphasize just a few chapters back, chapter 14 of John, where he says to them and gives them this promise, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Jesus promised his followers then and now a life that is shaped by joy, because, because it is grounded in the gift of his peace. And that's not the same kind of peace that the world can give. We live in a broken world. But it is a real and lasting peace no matter what the world's circumstances might be. If we are going to live as an Easter people, we must have our own personal encounter with the risen Christ. And when we do have that encounter, we will have that peace that passes all understanding. And that is indeed something to celebrate, right? Amen? All right. But that also leads us to the second point about living as an Easter people. When we are an Easter people, we celebrate the beginning of our mission. We celebrate the beginning of our mission. Because once you have encountered the risen Christ, you can't keep that to yourself. Notice in our text today that the scripture says the disciples were overjoyed. They don't want to stay locked up in fear in that upper room anymore. They are going to go and tell about the good news. And for us to live as an Easter people, we have a commission. Verse 21, Jesus says, As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. The beginning of the mission of the church comes from this post-Easter experience. And as Easter people, that means you and I, we have a job to do, a task. Because by definition, a commission means the authority granted to a person or an organization to act as an agent for another. A group of people authorized to carry out a duty. Jesus has given us the authority to carry out his mission. We have a calling. We have a task, a job to do. And so when we celebrate Easter as a church, we celebrate the beginning of the church's mission. But we also celebrate the beginning of our own commission when we encounter that risen Lord. Matthew says it a little more explicitly in his gospel. We often call this the Great Commission. This is from chapter 28. Hear these words. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. We are called and commissioned to go and tell. Jesus passes the job of spreading the good news that God has sent him to his disciples, and he passes it on to you and I. 
when the church celebrates Easter. We celebrate a personal encounter with the risen Christ, and we celebrate the beginning of our mission because each of us has been commissioned to spread the good news. And then thirdly, we celebrate the empowerment of the Holy Spirit at Easter. This is why this text is so unique and can be used both for Easter and for Pentecost. You would notice there in verse 22 that, that Jesus says, He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. And here the verb to breathe is the same verb used to describe God's breath in Genesis when he creates the first human being. Genesis 2-7, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So we find here that Jesus is now breathing the Holy Spirit, breathing life into those disciples. And this is no accidental image that that word is used. And in her commentary, Gail O'Day says it this way, those who believe in Jesus receive new life as children of God. And the Holy Spirit is the breath that sustains that new life. Those who believe in Jesus receive new life as children of God. And the Holy Spirit is the breath that sustains that new life. The church's work, our work, is an extension of Jesus Christ's work himself. And as believers, we are empowered by that Holy Spirit. I know today it can be difficult to share about Jesus with others. We live in a society now where it has really become taboo to talk about your Christian faith or to be a Christian in many ways. But I believe, I believe that as our relationship with Christ grows, that he opens up opportunities and gives us inner strength to share his message and to share the good news. Because we have received the same spirit that those early disciples received. That spirit was strong enough that they were no longer afraid to go out and tell, even in the midst of facing persecution and possible crucifixion, which we know they all ended up being martyred. But that is the same spirit that dwells in us. The gift of the spirit and the commissioning of the church occurred on that first Easter evening. And we celebrate the resurrection. And we also celebrate the beginning of the church's mission and our own commission to go and tell by the gift of the Holy Spirit that empowers us to do so. You know, Jeremy and I were talking the other day. His friend Corky was here, and, and he loves it when we quote Corky, just so you know. Just kidding. He really doesn't like that. <laughs> no, he doesn't care. He loves Corky. But Corky was here for our leadership conference, and, and he said people share what they love. People share what they love. In other words, if you love something, you are going to talk about it. It's just going to kind of come naturally to you to do that. And uh, Jeremy and I were talking about when you go to a restaurant and you have like a great meal and a good experience and the service is good, and you, you're going to tell other people about that, right? And the way you talk about it and explain it and describe it is going to be different than if you've only heard about it. Oh, yeah, well, I heard it's good. This is different when you've actually experienced it for yourself. So that's what we're trying to say today, that when we are an Easter people, it is not only a time for us to celebrate that we have a risen Savior, and that is definitely something worth celebrating. But it is also, it is also the time when we remind ourselves that we have a mission, that we have each been commissioned to share that good news. And we do that through the power of that same Holy Spirit that he breathed onto those disciples that early evening. Amen? So my prayer for us as a church, as a church family, is that we will lean into being the people of Easter that God has called us to be each and every day. Amen.